This video is supported by Squarespace. When I was growing up, my grandparents had a ranch out in West Texas, and I spent a few summers out there helping them uh, pull in the harvest, usually wheat and oats. Pro tip, walking around in waist-high wheat uh, feels like walking around in waist-high wheat. Walking around in waist-high oats feels like you're swimming in fiberglass. Itchy for years. Still a little itchy. Something else I learned when I was a kid that was just as mind-blowing to me was that my grandparents would actually get paid by the government to not farm in certain fields. This is known as a farm subsidy. They actually got paid to not do something. How do I get that job? It took me years to figure out exactly why it is they do this, but it all goes back to the Dust Bowl. You know, most people think about the depression, they think about the stock market tanking, about really high unemployment, nobody could get a job, that kind of thing, but it also just happened to coincide with a massive ecological disaster. Farmers in the early 20th century were encouraged to produce as much food as possible, and this totally overstressed the land, and then combine that with an eight-year drought, and next thing you know, the wind is blowing away all the topsoil, and now nothing can grow anywhere. Hundreds of people died from dust-related illnesses, crops were impossible to grow because there was no topsoil, and thousands of animals were slaughtered just to keep people from starving. So laws were passed that mandated that farmers give their fields a little bit of rest every once in a while, but the problem with that is if they aren't growing food, if they aren't growing crops, then they have no money coming in, they've got no livelihood. So FDR actually swept in a series of reforms that provided subsidies for farmers so they could still have a livelihood while they weren't planning on certain fields, and this was to prevent another Dust Bowl scenario from happening. These days, subsidies are mostly used to manipulate grain prices, but the point of it all is that we faced an environmental crisis, and we took steps to fix it, and we haven't had that problem since. Go humans. Today we face a larger and somewhat trickier situation. With global temperatures and the population on the rise, our current way of consuming and producing food is becoming pretty unsustainable. Of course, the food industry is worth billions and billions of dollars, and people's food habits don't exactly change overnight. Ask anybody trying keto. But this is a change that we're going to have to make, and we're going to have to get pretty creative to do it. So you might find yourself eating some pretty interesting foods in the future. It's a joke we've all heard before, how can you tell if somebody's a vegan? Just wait, they'll tell you. But in fairness to vegans, they are kind of right, which is the most annoying thing about them. Because it's not just about being friendly to animals, our meat-based diets are very environmentally taxing and frankly unsustainable. Let's talk about cow farts for a second. Livestock, while quite tasty and a good source of protein, make up 14.5% of greenhouse emissions on this planet. And as if that isn't bad enough, 40% of Earth's habitable land is being used for livestock. That's land that could be growing plants that are sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. Cows are basically meat machines that convert oxygen-producing plants into pure methane. And it's a horribly inefficient way to produce protein. The feed conversion ratio for beef is 6 to 1. That means it takes 6 pounds of feed to produce 1 pound of beef. And that's an amount of waste that we're just not going to have room for in the future. But let's not just blame the cows for being so delicious and farty, much like our pre dust bowl ancestors. Farming methods are increasingly stressing our resources. Groundwater in many parts of this country and the world are drying up. Within the next few decades, billions of people worldwide are going to have to decide whether they want to give water to their animals, to their crops, or to themselves. You want to live in a Mad Max hellscape? Because that's how you get a Mad Max hellscape. So we've got to find some alternatives to our current sources of protein and nutrients. And we need to find it fast. So let's talk about some of the coolest and, uh, frankly, weirdest <laughs> agricultural practices we could be using in the future that's going to make a huge impact on our way of life. First on our list is edible insects. Yeah, we're going to eat bugs. Edible insects have been in the diets of cultures around the world for centuries, like the chapulin, a cricket that grows in southern Mexico. And research says there's something to this. Insects like crickets, termites, and caterpillars are just as rich in protein as livestock, but they're way more efficient. Instead of having a food conversion ratio of 6 to 1, these have 1.1 to 1. That's super efficient. Plus, insects can be farmed in large quantities in a much smaller space. Or even in outer space. A 2015 study in Beijing showed that mealworms would actually be a great source of protein for astronauts on extended long missions like to Mars. Back on Earth, we might find that instead of spraying crops with pesticides to get rid of insects, we could just gather them up and eat them. Put them on the dinner plate. Gross, maybe, but is it grosser than spraying poison on our food? Now, you might be saying there's absolutely no way this is ever going to happen. There's no way people are going to actually eat bugs for a living. But again, it's been done in cultures around the world for quite a long time. And just because it's weird to us now, doesn't mean it's going to be weird at some point in the future. Besides, you don't have to just eat the bugs. You can produce them as flour. Cricket flour, a type of flour that's actually made from 
freeze-dried crickets, is already out there and you can cook with it right now. And in fact, there are snack bars that you can buy that have cricket flour in it. It's very protein rich, doesn't taste like anything different, actually just tastes like an Adwala bar. But hey, if bugs aren't your thing, how do you feel about fake meat? Meat substitutes actually go all the way back to ancient China. They've been reintroduced and refined over the years and have made a lot of improvements, especially since the late 1800s. Technological breakthroughs over the last 20 or so years have allowed fake meat products to become more popular and accepted around the world, and big business has started to take a notice of this. Tyson Foods recently made a sizable investment in a company called Beyond Meat. Nestle, the makers of Kit Kat and Toll House Cookies, owns Sweet Earth Foods, who advertise eco-friendly alternatives to traditional meat pizzas, burritos, and sandwiches. Scientists have actually found that feeding special diets to certain types of fungi can produce a meat-tasting and mouth-feely product that is almost indistinguishable from meat. And one of the most successful recent products called the Impossible Burger actually uses a protein called leg hemoglobin that comes from a certain type of yeast. Leg hemoglobin actually has a lot of iron in it, so it actually tastes and looks like blood. Blood from plants. They've actually chemically deconstructed the taste of a burger and have added flavorings to make that imitate a burger in the closest way possible. When you eat an Impossible Burger, you're basically tasting what science says a burger should taste like. The Impossible Burger and similar products use way fewer resources and land to create the same kind of protein that you would get from a cow. So you can have your cow and eat it too. Does that make sense? Number three is Nebraska oranges. We talk a lot on this channel about the cool things that are gonna be going on in the next 20 or 30 years. Gene therapies, colonies on the moon and Mars, the ascension of our AI overlords. But what about oranges grown in Nebraska? Now, if the term oranges from Nebraska doesn't sound weird to you, then clearly you didn't spend your weekend studying orange crops like I did. I used to have friends. Nebraska's climate, while perfect for growing corn and wheat and amazing basketball movies, is too cold in certain parts of the year to grow oranges. Which is why oranges are more closely associated with warmer climates like Florida. But there is one thing in Nebraska that makes it a good place for oranges to grow. And that thing is an 86-year-old retired postal worker named Russ Finch. Russ designs geothermal greenhouses that can keep orange, grapefruit, and fig trees alive 12 months of the year in Nebraska. He's been operating his own greenhouse for more than a quarter of a century and sells hundreds of pounds of produce at farmer's markets. What makes his design special is the efficiency involved. The greenhouse is warmed obviously by the sun, but also by pipes that are buried eight feet underground. The earth at that depth is well insulated, so the warmth from the tubes keeps fruits and vegetables alive, virtually eliminating the need to heat with fossil fuels. The most recent version of Russ's design can operate for about a dollar a day. And the best thing is his greenhouse is super easy to put up. It only takes six people two hours to install one of these things which is great for anybody that wants to become self-sustainable and you know, grow their own food, but it also has cool implications about Mars missions. Another cool thing to look out for are vertical crops. If we're gonna feed the 9.7 billion people expected to be on Earth by 2050, we're gonna need a lot of leafy greens. We don't have a whole lot of room to grow that. Vertical farming offers a solution that's actually gotten the attention of a lot of investors over the years. And there are three different ways to do this. Hydroponic farms grow crops whose roots are submerged rather than covered in soil. Aeroponic farms miss suspended roots using a tenth the water of hydroponic farms. And aquaponic farms use a closed cycle exchange between fish and hydroponic plants to fertilize for higher yields. Two of the biggest companies that are currently working on these kinds of things are Aero Farms and Bowery Farming, both in New Jersey. Because, you know, the Garden State. According to Bowery's website, they use 95% less water than traditional agriculture and produce 100 times the output of the same amount of land. Aero Farms, meanwhile, is a massive operation producing 2 million pounds of greens annually with plans to seed their biggest facility yet sometime this year. And if you'd like to try this out in your own home, IKEA actually has a setup that they're about to start selling that offers a hydroponic solution right there in your kitchen. These kinds of methods have been proven viable in a multitude of climate situations, even on the International Space Station. But perhaps the biggest application of these ideas is the plant scraper, a concept to surround skyscraping buildings with translucent outer skins transforming into vertical farm platforms. A groundbreaking ceremony for the World Food Building, the planet's first plant scraper, was held in 2012. If all goes well, the building could open its doors in 2020. And last but not least, water balls. As humans, we need water. Unfortunately, that water needs to be carried in something, and lately we've been opting to do that in one-use plastic bottles that we drink and then chuck into the ocean with 10 million of its friends. Sounds like a party, but it's not. It's, it's, it's not good. Skipping Rocks Labs may have an answer. They produce these water ball things under the brand name Oho. Because why drink water when you can eat it? The container is made of seaweed. It's tasteless, non-toxic, and biodegrades in just a few weeks. And it's actually cheaper to produce than plastic. 
And these water blobs are already popular at marathons where it's just easier to grab one of these things and pop it in your mouth and try to run with a, a cup of water. But in everyday use, it still seems like you would need to carry it in something, which kind of defeats the purpose. But hey, when the AI overlords take over and mandate that this is the only way we can consume water anymore, then, uh, well, all hail the AI overlords. But what about a real sci-fi idea? Whatever happened to the replicator from Star Trek? I mean, that's what we really want, right? As we speak, 3D printing is getting scary good. We're already experimenting with 3D printing organs for transplant. Could 3D printed food be far behind? A replicator style device would require us to be able to manipulate things at the atomic level, which while we're getting there, still got a ways to go before we can do that. But maybe the much bigger question is, will we get there? Will we survive this technological adolescence as Carl Sagan calls it? It's that dangerous period between when we have access to technology and the time when we actually can use that technology wisely. Sagan actually once said that one of the main reasons to look for alien life would be to show that a civilization could make it through this period. He was actually really concerned about this. Will any of these future foods actually wind up on your plate someday? Nah, it's hard to say. But you can bet as we push more towards sustainable technologies and food production, more and more ideas like this are going to be coming up. So which one of these do you think will make the most difference? Was there anything I left out that you think should be on this list? Talk about it in the comments. Better yet, if there's a sustainable food idea that you're really into, make a website about it using Squarespace. Squarespace is a premium online website platform that makes it easy for you to create professional looking websites without having years of graphic design experience. They've got easy to use drag and drop templates that make you look like a friggin' hero with widgets to superpower your site and e-commerce solutions and great customer support for all those noobs out there. Make a website on Squarespace to tell the world about sustainable food or how bad cow farts are or just to scream as loudly as possible that you're a vegan. You know you want to. Head over to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott to get a free one month trial of Squarespace. And if you decide you like it and want to keep doing it, enter Joe Scott as a coupon code and you'll get 10% off your purchase of websites or domains. Whatever it is you're passionate about, the best way to get started is to build a website. So go to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott and get started today. Big thanks to Squarespace for supporting this channel. And I want to give a big shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are building an awesome community and supporting this channel, helping it grow. You have no idea how much it helps. I got a few people to join uh, that have joined recently. I want to call them out just real quick. We got Ed Davs, Martin Mostel, David Densford, Michael Gumbly, and Cliff Odich. Best I could do, man. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for signing up. If you would like to join them, get access to cool perks and see behind the scenes stuff that other people don't get to see, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, check out some of my other stuff. I think you might like that too. And if you do, hit subscribe. I come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.